In one corner, we have Sharif, the Bobcat Cronomer. He hails from Silver Spring, Maryland, went to college at Ohio Wellesleyan University, also has a master's from College of London, and he holds his college's record for the 800-meter run, Speedy Dude, and third place finalist in the 2005 Pumpkin Chunk and Pumpkin Launching Contest. And today he'll be talking about neuroscience from the perspective of consciousness. Give it up for Sharif! Clap! Woo, 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 woo! All right, and in our other corner, we've got Rick the Gardner Krause, raised in Palatka, Florida. He attended the University of South Florida. He can run faster than both of his cats, also a speedy guy. He's survived countless injuries from avocados, but still makes amazing guacamole. I can, I can totally vibe with that, Rick. And for us today, he'll be talking about the neuroscience behind learning. So let's take a moment and let these two get amped up to take their two perspectives on neuroscience head to head, and we'll get this fight going. So you two, I want this to be a clean fight. Do you guys have anything to say to each other? Yeah, I, I, for everyone out there, I doubt you're going to learn anything from Rick's talk. Ooh, ooh, that's harsh, man. What about you, Rick? Well, I just hope that you can stay... <clears throat> I just hope that you can stay conscious for Sharif's talk. I know that might be a little challenging. Mm. Mm. Burn! Yeah, I, I'm sorry to say, everyone, who, uh, who anyone out there who saw the flyers, there was a little bit of false advertising Rick and I might have looked like we were the same height, but I have some evidence here uh, to show that we are pretty different in our heights. I actually ran a statistical significant test, and this is what we call in the sciences highly statistically significant. Ooh, we got anything else, Rick? That's okay. Well, I, I got to let you guys in on a secret. Sharif doesn't like cheese. So. <laughs> Oh, come on. All right. So that sounds like some pretty good trash talk between you two, but let's let the science and the presentation skills speak for themselves. So we'll be starting off with our first presenter. Uh, so if you're not presenting, go to your corners and we're going to see who's going to do it first by this wonderful coin flip. All right. Sharif's going to go first. Rick, to your corner. Sharif. Let's get in the fight. Excellent. I hope everyone's having a great evening. Thanks for joining us for Exploring Science and the Science Battle. Uh, my name again is Sharif Kronemer. I'm a six-year PhD student at Yale University, and I am fascinated by the brain. In particular, I'm fascinated by this phenomenon uh, that we call consciousness. Now, consciousness is this really mysterious but super important ability that we all have, which allows us to experience the world around us. So one of the key questions that we need to ask when we're studying consciousness is, what is this phenomenon to begin with? So fundamentally, at its core, consciousness is your ability to experience the world, to know what it's like to see something, to taste something, to hear something, to feel something. And when you're conscious of that thing, you're able to know that it exists. And this not only applies to things in the world outside of you, but it also applies to things inside you as well, like your thoughts, your emotions, and so on. So this is the main topic of my research, trying to understand what is consciousness and where does it come from. And this is something we're going to discuss a bit at the end of my talk or towards the middle of my talk. But I first want to begin with something a little bit more fundamental, a little bit more at the core of how the brain works and how it might allow us to be conscious in the first place. And I'm, I'm going to begin with a story. So a long time ago, maybe a few hundred years ago, there was a lot of debate about what exactly made things or, or animals alive, what made a stone sort of just sit there and do nothing, but another animal, like a deer or a rabbit or bird, able to go around, move, do whatever it wanted, except when it would sleep or after it died. And there was a theory that it might be this gas that they called ether. And this ether might be what allowed for uh, there to be a living thing. So when you were filled with this ether, you were alive and able to move and do whatever you do. And then when you would die, that ether would go away, would leave you. Now, the ether theory, by the way, is wrong. 
And Luigi Galvani, this uh, scientist from Italy, had a idea. He thought maybe it's not this gas or ether, maybe instead it's our animal electricity, an electrical system instead of a gas-based system that allowed something to be alive and move around. So he had some very interesting experiments to prove potentially how this would work. So he took uh, frog legs and attached frog legs onto a metal wire. And then he connected that metal wire between two trees and he waited for a thunderstorm to come. So whenever there's a thunderstorm, the atmosphere is filled with electricity. And what he found is those frog legs were jumping on that metal wire even though they were totally detached from the living frog. And this gave the first evidence that there might be this electrical system in nature, in biology in particular, that might allow living things to do what they do, to move around and to sense. And we can look even more detailed now at the brain and at our nervous system, the system that stores uh, these electrical systems. And particularly a, a one type of cell called neurons, which you've probably heard of before, uh, that had that in our brain, there's about 86 billion of them. There's a lot of these neurons. And these neurons are specialized and they have this special power to be able to send, to generate and send these electrical pulses, those same electrical pulses that Galvani was manipulating by putting these frog legs out during a thunderstorm. And there's one part of the neuron that's particularly important for sending those electrical pulses. And it's this part of the neuron that I have boxed out here, which is. Uh, called uh, the axon. So you can think of a neuron in some way like a tree. At the very top of the tree are the branches, and that's where the signal comes into the neuron. And then at the very bottom of the tree where the roots are, that's where in the neuron the signal goes out. And in the middle, the tree trunk, is where the electrical pulse is sent through. So you can see there that our electrical pulse just flies right through the center of uh, the axon. Now, I have a quick question for everyone out there. Let's say we did a race between the electrical pulses that go through the axon and an airplane going at full speed. So who thinks would who thinks the electrical pulse would win the race versus the airplane? Uh, feel free to offer your answers in the in the chat. The pulse or the airplane? Lots of pulses out there. Pulse, pulse, pulse. Some airplanes. Well, here's the answer. The airplane is way faster. The airplane is almost twice as fast as these electrical pulses. The airplane can go about 500 miles an hour. Your electrical pulses in your body are going maybe 300 miles an hour. But guess what? That's totally fast enough when the furthest distance these electrical pulses need to go is from the top of your head to the base of your feet. But of course, an airplane needs to go thousands of miles, so it needs to go much quicker to get to its destination in any reasonable amount of time. So electrical pulses are really important. And those electrical pulses, when they come to the roots of the neuron, the very bottom, they stimulate the release of these chemicals at the spaces between neurons called a synapse. These chemicals are called neurotransmitters. And there are a lot of different types of neurotransmitters. Uh, and they have funny names like acetylcholine, the first neurotransmitter also discovered in frogs, which is important for allowing your muscles to uh, contract. Dopamine, I'm going to talk about that in a moment, which is important for lots of things, but also for, uh, for reward, for pleasure, for feeling good. Serotonin is important for mood. Adrenaline is important for being awake and, and attentive. And GABA keeps your brain sort of in a quieter state so it doesn't get too crazy. And uh, these neurotransmitters help signal and drive action, behavior, thought, emotion. Uh, all of these things come from these neurotransmitters. And let's as an example, talk about dopamine, which again, dopamine is all about uh, pleasure or reward, feeling good. So how does dopamine relate to some of the things that we like in everyday life? So let me start with a question. Who out there loves broccoli? Just raw broccoli, just take a bite of that raw broccoli. Yes or no? Oh, we got some me's. Okay. A lot of you out there. Any no's out there who are just like, nah, broccoli is not for me. Only steamed. <laughs> so what's interesting about broccoli is I think in general, maybe some of you, maybe our audience is a particularly healthy audience here. But um, 
maybe uh, you can appreciate that there's not a lot of people who like broccoli out there, particularly just raw broccoli. And when we look at what's, uh, what is released uh, when someone eats broccoli, as far as dopamine is concerned, no dopamine gets released. And that's because it's pretty boring. People, people don't like it. But what about cake? People really like cake, lots of sugar, lots of fat in it, and a lot of dopamine is released when you eat cake. Now let's talk about something that's even more inducing of dopamine, like recreational drugs. So a lot of recreational drugs will stimulate even greater releases of dopamine, such an unnatural level of release of dopamine that this is what creates in part the addictive cycle uh, that unfortunately many people find them in, themselves in, in uses of recreational drugs, and also why you should never use them because it will get this chemical balance out of whack. It will uh, prevent your body from working as it normally does. So this leads to a really important idea. The uh, important idea is this. Electricity plus these chemicals, these, neuro, uh, these neurotransmitters, equals everything that you do. It's really profound. Imagine every thought you've ever had, every feeling you've ever had, everything that you've ever done is driven by these electrical pulses and these neurotransmitters. It's really amazing. Now, we have been looking at just individual neuronal signals or pulses and looking at these individual chemicals. But if we zoom out a bit and look at the neurons together, acting not just independently, but working as we call, it, call in the neurosciences a network. So we're talking about thousands or even millions of neurons acting together. They form functional units. So these are areas of the brain that have particular roles to play. So when you look at the brain, it looks sort of boring. There's not a lot of differences in terms of what it looks like on its surface. But with new approaches to study the brain, what we find is that there are regions that are particularly important for thinking, like the areas in uh, orange, like the front of the brain and the back of the brain. There's areas that are particularly important for language, like the areas in red. There's memory regions as well as sensing regions and moving regions. So we've been discovering more and more of these different uh, regions in the brain uh, that are important for what you do in your daily life. But what's obviously missing here is where is consciousness? This is the topic I'm interested in. I didn't have a nice circle there showing you the location of consciousness, and that's because we just don't know. And that is exactly what I'm researching. So to understand where is consciousness located, I'm using this technology called uh, magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI. So it's a big magnet that looks like almost a donut, and you go inside that donut hole. And what I can do with it is take some pictures of people's brain without having to hurt them at all. And this is actually my brain that you're seeing a, an image of. And I can look at what is your brain doing when someone is conscious of something, when you have an experience of something. So that's exactly what I did in a recent study of 35 people. And I'm going to show you the results now. So here are the results. This looks really complicated. Don't worry. I'm going to walk you through it. So the brain you're seeing, why are there so many different images of the same brain? Well, imagine if you're taking a slice of a brain like this, and we're taking slices up and up and up someone's head. So from left to right, we're going from lower to higher slices. Areas that you see in red, those red blobs, mean increases in brain activity when you're conscious. Areas in blue mean decreases in brain activity when you're conscious. So what we're seeing at these very early time points are regions like this, the midbrain here, the thalamus here, the insula. These are areas that are deep inside the brain that are well known for acting almost like a light switch. So they sort of turn on the rest of the brain and keep it on and keep it engaged. So when these areas are on, you're active, you're engaged. When these areas go off, you're more sleepy, you're tired. And in bad, in bad cases, when you have damage to these regions, you might be in a coma. Uh, you might not be able to be conscious ever again. Meanwhile, at these later time periods, um, you will notice uh, these big changes in the back of the brain and some big increases in the front of the brain. So this is like the light bulb areas of the brain. The surface of the brain is like the light bulb in this analogy here. So we need deep regions that are going to turn on the light switch, and then they're going to activate and brighten uh, the areas on the surface of the brain, uh, which is the light bulb, presumably. So together, the light switch and the light bulb are working together to create what we think is the consciousness network. 
The next question that I'm interested in, and this is coming towards Dan here, is when is consciousness happening exactly? And for this uh, question, I use a different technology called electroencephalography or EEG. So here I am with a bunch of electrodes on my head, and at all times that electrical activity is happening not just in your brain, but it's leaking out of your brain right now, and I can record that leaky electrical activity from those electrodes on the surface of uh, someone's head. And that's exactly what I did, and here is a, a real result from my study. So let me orient you again. What you're seeing is the image of someone's head as if you're looking from above, and each uh, dot is an electrode, and warm colors are increases in activity when you're conscious, and cool colors are decreases in activity when you're conscious. And what is being shown in time is not seconds, but milliseconds. So 1,000 milliseconds equals one second. So what we see is that all of the activity that's important for making you conscious, it happens in about one second after the thing that happens in the world that you might be conscious of. So pretty, pretty quick, pretty quick indeed. So let's uh, review what we learned today. So what we learned today is that electricity plus chemicals equals everything that you do. We learned that in terms of the question, where is consciousness? There are deep areas of the brain that act like the light switch, and there are surface areas of the brain that act like the light bulb. And together, they allow you to be consciousness, conscious. And then finally, towards the question of when does consciousness happen in the brain, it all takes about one second from the onset of something in the world that you might be aware of. So that's it. Thank you all for your attention. I hope you enjoyed this talk and glad to take any questions. Thank you. All right, Sharif, that was a great talk. Um, very well presented. I really enjoyed all of your diagrams and everything it was really easy to follow. Um, so what we're going to have you all do now is take a vote of a few different topics that um, were covered uh, or that we talked about at the very beginning. So this is how we're going to rate Sharif's talk. Um, and in the meantime, please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A, um, and we will do our best to get to them as you all are voting. I'm going to bring Rick back out. Uh, I know from the earlier chat, he's a crowd favorite, so let's see if he can live up to his reputation. Here's Rick Kraus. All right. I'm just pulling up the chat. You can see it. Nice. Thanks for all the excitement. I really appreciate that, everyone. All right. Now, uh, as Delphina introduced, my name is Rick Kraus, and I'm extremely excited to talk to you all today about learning and memory. Uh, and in particular, my question that I try to research and understand is, why do we learn about some things faster than others? So maybe you've noticed before that you learn the words to your favorite song a lot easier than you do for, for instance, like vocabulary words. But there are lots of ways that you could understand how this works in our brain. Uh, but the way that I'm going to talk to you about doing it is the way that I use lasers, mice, and milkshakes to do this. But let's take a step back first and understand why should we study learning and memory? Whenever I was thinking about becoming a scientist, I thought about all the things that really interest me. And learning and memory is one of the ones that interest me the most. Because if you think about it, everything that you experience in the world, you're some, your brain is somehow taking that experience and storing it as a memory. And then you can actually do some sort of mental time traveling in order to use that information later uh, to be able to make really good decisions. So I find that really fascinating how it works. But it's also really important for trying to help people that have disorders in memory. So for instance, you may have heard of Alzheimer's disease. This often affects uh, older people, and it uh, often happens to where they have trouble remembering certain things. And so that can be really difficult for both them and their families. But on the flip side of this as well, there's something called post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. And so this is kind of the, the flip side, to where a memory is too strong, and they have a hard time forgetting it and uh, moving past it. And so these are really the two extremes of memory. And healthy, normal memory is somewhere in the middle. And so if we better understand how memories uh, throughout regular life uh, are formed and how our brain handles those, we can try to help people on the outset of that as well. But if we want to study memory, we have to really think about how to define memory. So what makes a memory? So I want you to take a step back and just reflect on one of your favorite memories. So for instance, think about something that really makes you happy to remember. So just take a few seconds and think about that and try to relive that memory. 
So hopefully that was very refreshing. But now I want you to take that memory and imagine I want you to take it from your head and stick it into mine. What sort of information would you have to include to do that? So I don't mean the specifics about whether who you're with or whatever, but specific types of information. So go ahead and write in the chat what classification or type of information would you have to have if you wanted to take it from your head and put it into mine. Stuff, okay. You can just give me your brain. Wow, I'm seeing some awesome stuff fly in so far. So where you are, the what, what's happening. Great, exactly. Why it happened. So I'm going to just highlight a couple of those right now. So the where was hit upon. Exactly. So where was it? Was it at your house? Was it at your grandma's house? Was it at the beach? What day it happened or when? Exactly. Was it yesterday? Was it today? Was it your fifth birthday? And also the what? Is it something really good? Is it something really bad? So all of these things are type information that make up a memory. And I'm going to focus on specifically the what for right now. And I'm going to have to give you a crash course and a couple of things about the brain so that I can talk to you about some of my interest, uh, some of my research. So the first is this brain chemical. And Sharif already talked about it. It's called acetylcholine. And this is a really fancy way to draw it. This is how chemists draw it. And I probably couldn't even draw this from memory. So for the rest of my talk, when you see this symbol with the ACH inside of it, uh, think acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter or brain chemical that is released all over your brain especially in response to emotionally salient stimuli. So that just means something that has either a positive or negative value that an animal needs to pay attention to. And your brain cells are constantly communicating with each other. And acetylcholine allows some neurons to talk more or less to each other. It's kind of like a traffic light. And, and that, this is really important to have a traffic light for these brain cells because you have a ton of brain cells in your brain. Do you remember what Sharif told you? How many do you happen to have? Do you remember in the chat? Let me know. Oh, we got some exact numbers. Awesome. Yeah, 86 billion. Billion with a B. Or exactly. And so if you had all of those talking at once, that wouldn't be very good for you. And so I'm going to introduce you to two brain regions that I'm interested in, and one of them sends acetylcholine to the other. So this is the side view of a mouse brain going this direction, if you're going sort of in. And we're going to focus here on the bottom part. So in this bottom part, there's an area called the nucleus basalis. And so this is a group of cells that coordinate the activity of lots of other brain regions. Or in other words, it can make a bunch of spread out parts of the brain all become active together or quiet together. And one way that it does this is through acetylcholine. So here's a cartoon image of one brain cell moving its arm to other parts of the brain and releasing acetylcholine. One of the places that it does this is the basolateral amygdala, or BLA. So this is the group of brain cells that becomes active when something exciting is happening, and it helps store that memory. This could be something really good or really bad. And my research is to see if the levels of acetylcholine that are released in the BLA is involved in controlling how quickly we learn something or how strong a memory is. And the way that I do this is by using a technique or a tool called optogenetics. So this is kind of a big word, but it's really just a combination word. So opto for light and genetics for genetic engineering. And the reason why we're doing this is so we can turn on certain brain cells. And this video is going to help show what I mean by how we do that. So this is just a 3D sort of movie uh, of a fake brain cell. But what you're going to see is these green proteins are going to show up. And these are the optogenetic proteins. And these are special because we've genetically engineered it to where this brain cell will turn on just by shining a laser at it. So you'll see these proteins will open up when the laser comes on, and this will turn on the brain cell. And this is really different than what happens normally. Normally, brain cells aren't sensitive to light. So we can target specific brain cells that we want and turn only those on. So here's a zoomed out view with a lot of brain cells. Some of them are randomly becoming active, but some of these that are shown in green are the ones we have the opto control over. So if we flash a light at it, it'll turn all those green cells on. And so this gives us a really powerful technique in order to turn on certain brain cells and see how that affects behavior, which is what I'm really interested in. 
especially learning and memory. So just to bring us back to my research, I'm interested in these mucocephalic cells that reach out to the DLA and release acetylcholine. So I put the opto tool inside of these cells. And here's an image of one of these uh, cells that I found. This is a zoomed in that I took from a microscope that I found really beautiful. So this cell here is one that reaches out to the amygdala, the DLA. But it lives here, but sends its arms out. And so here is the DLA. So all this green sort of spaghetti stuff is the cells that live here, but send their arms out to release acetylcholine. And so I can plant an uh, optic fiber above the DLA, which is kind of like a, a flashlight connect it to a laser, and now if I shine a light, I can make there be more acetylcholine release in the DLA. So for instance, let's show it again because I think this is a really cool animation. And look at that, magic. And it, this technique kind of is like magic. It's really amazing and gives neuroscientists an ability to turn on certain brain cells in a way that really wasn't possible. But the amazing thing about this is that we can do this in awake behaving mice. So all of that stuff I just described to you can happen inside this mouse's brain, and we can do this while the mouse is learning. And so we can stimulate with the with the lasers and see how it affects the mouse's learning. But let's let's stop here for a second. Why are we talking about mice? I was just talking about humans and how they learn and diseases that affect humans. Well, mouse brains are actually not that different from human brains in a lot of really important ways, especially when it comes to learning about positive or negative experiences. They have a lot of the same brain regions. And they also use the same brain chemicals as us. So if we understand how this learning works in a more simple system, we can maybe use that to understand a more complicated system like humans and help uh, those that are suffering from memory disorders. But I can't just ask this mouse if it learned better, right? I have to be kind of clever in how I design my experiment. So what you're going to see here is on the left side of the screen is what's happening in the mouse's brain. And on the right side of the screen is what the mouse is actually doing. So I have to give these mice a little job, and they have to learn how to do this job, and I measure how good they get at doing this. And so over time, they figure out that whenever they hear this sound, this beep, they need to put their nose in a hole like this. And if they do that, they get milkshakes. And mice really, really love milkshakes, actually, a lot, probably as much as some of you do. And so um, what they want to do is get as many milkshakes as possible. But the trick here is that half of the mice are normal. They're learning just like a normal mouse would, or maybe just like you would. But the other half, I'm gonna be giving the opto stimulation to increase the amount of acetylcholine in the DLA. And so I wanna see if it makes these mice learn faster. So all the mice can get as many milkshakes as they want, drink them up, but I'm gonna compare the differences between the control and the opto group. So I'm gonna show you that data right now. On the x-axis, we have training day. So each, uh, each day I put the mice in the box for 30 minutes a day. And it takes them a few days because I can't tell them what I need them to do. They have to figure it out themselves. On the y-axis, we have rewards earned or how many milkshakes they got. And then I'm going to draw a green dotted line here at the 20 rewards mark. Because if they get about 20 rewards a day, it means that they figured out this job and they're doing a really good uh, job of it. So the data that I'm showing right now is for the control mice or the normal mice. So it takes them about eight days to cross this green dotted line to where I've considered that they've learned it, they've done a, they figured it out. And so each data point here is the average of six mice. So I'm pretty confident that it takes about eight days for mice, normal mice to get it. But what do you think would happen for the optimize? Do you think they learned faster or slower? How many days do you think it takes them to learn this task and cross this green dotted line? You can go ahead and throw it in the chat. How many days? So you had to pick one. Okay, we've seen a bunch of different guesses. Nice. Faster, slower. We're seeing a good spread of it. And I'm glad that not everybody is uh, jumping on it right away because that'd make me feel kind of bad, actually, if you knew exactly what was going to happen. <laughs> I'm glad that uh, there's some, some differences. Uh, so I'm going to do the big reveal. And it takes about four days for these mice to figure this out, which means that they're learning faster because it takes them only four training days to learn what it took normal mice eight training days to do. So it's I, this really blew my mind when I first saw these results. And what it means is that just by increasing the amount of acetylcholine in the DLA at the time of learning about a reward, 
it was sort of like we made these mice uh, study a little harder, or we tutored them in this behavior. Uh, but the point of my research now is to figure out why this happens, because it's cool that we can make smarter mice, sure, but that's not what we're really doing this research for. We want to understand why this happens and how this happens, so that we can try to help people with disorders affecting memory, such as PTSD, addiction, or Alzheimer's disease. I'd like to thank everyone very much for your attention and all the people in my lab, other scientists that I've worked with, um, people who paid for these experiments, and also the mice that made this plot. So thank you very much. Awesome, great stuff, Rick. Uh, some of that imaging was so cool. And like, just the fact that you can train mice to do stuff like that just <laughs> blows my mind. <laughs> um, so similar to what we did before, we're gonna open that polling again for you all to answer the questions regarding uh, how well you understood the talk and how cool the talk was. Um, so thank you, Rick, for your presentation. All right, so we have Deandra here, who's going to help moderate this Q&A discussion. So thank you so much, Deandra, and thank you, Rick and Sharif, for your guys' awesome presentations. All right, guys, I have been looking through the chat. I have been looking through all of your wonderful questions you've asked, and I have Sharif and Rick back here to answer all of the questions. So we'll start with Sharif. Um, we had a lot of questions about unconsciousness. So could you explain what creates unconsciousness and is it possible for someone like an experienced monk to go unconscious at will? Yeah, those are very interesting questions. I offer a little bit of hint of an answer to those questions in the Q&A. So if consciousness is your ability to experience something and know uh, that you've had an experience, to say, yes, I saw something, I heard something, I felt something, Unconsciousness is instances where your brain will be processing that information, but you won't know about it. You're not aware of it. You're not having experience of it. What's really interesting is that there may be many examples. Actually, we might spend most of our days unconscious. Our brain is doing it for us under the hood, if you will. And it's only giving us little bits of information now and then to say, hey, this is what you're doing. Uh, this is what you're thinking, this is what you're feeling, and so on. Here's one quick example. The next time you speak, when you say something out loud, not something you've prepared, but just you know, talking with your friends or your family, do you really know what's coming out of your mouth before you say it? Or does it sort of just flow out of your mouth and you sort of retrospectively or sort of after the fact look back and say, oh, that's what I said, right? I meant to say that. And the point is that maybe even language, which we consider to be really linked up with experience or consciousness is actually a process that is mostly unconscious, subliminal. Wow, and, that was a, oh. I'm oh, sorry, and the monk question, I forgot the monks, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, uh, yes, there's some evidence that people can, uh, if they train a lot, they can alter how their brain works to some extent, their brain states, and maybe monks will be better able of keeping their mind blank rather than always looking at, you know, TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram, and so on. It was totally okay to cut me off. I really wasn't thinking when I was speaking. That must have just been my unconscious part of my brain. Words were just there, flowing. There it is. <laughs> um, okay, and so for the next question, um, we'll bring it back over to Rick now. Um, we had a lot of question about your mice. Um, and of course, you can, all, you can start by explaining, you know, how you take care of your mice. I know you're very, very nice to your mice friends and just reassure the chat about those sorts of things. Um, but there were some questions about um, how after the experiments, are the mice still normal? Or are there any side effects that you you notice? Yeah, I'm, well, I mean, those are all great questions and I'm glad you brought up the point about how much I care about the mice because um, any animal or any researcher who does research with animals takes it extremely seriously and is, is so do I. This is an extreme privilege to be able to work with animals and we don't take it lightly. So any experiments that we do with mice have to be approved by veterinarians. The veterinarians have to say that this is, uh, this is reasonable enough for us to do and also telling us how to do it most humanely. So anything we do is passed, by a vet, passed through a veterinarian. Um, and then there was as a question about sort of like how this works as well. So the mice sort of learn in trial and error, and I can't tell them like, hey, when that sound comes on, put your nose through a hole. 
they just sort of have to figure it out. And just like you would, if I put you in a box and you thought you might be able to get milkshakes, but you didn't know how you'd do it, you would start pushing buttons and, and leverage and stuff. Um, and then when it comes to the side effects, this is a really great question because some of my friends that work in New York showed that if they do the exact same thing, but when mice are learning about a negative experience, it actually makes that, that memory stronger and harder to forget. So it's crazy that it's the same brain area, same brain chemical, but for different memories, it has different effects. So acetylcholine isn't just a memory molecule, but it changes how your brain is working normally when it's learning. Wow, and I'm, I, am, I always, um, I don't work with mice personally, but I, I know that everyone who does work with animals cares about them so very much. They are safe after the experiment. Um, and so if you do like um, animals, like working with mice would be a good place to be. Um, and so now we have another question for Sharif. We had a lot of questions in the chat about brain appearances. So um, what if we had a small brain or how big can your brain get? And any other um, answers about when your brain is damaged in any sorts of way, how does that change the appearance? Yeah, those are all great questions. So first of all, our biology has come up with, our natural selection has come up with a very uh, innovative way of fitting in a lot of brain into a small space, which is to take the brain and crumple it. And that's why the brain has all these folds in it. If you actually laid the brain flat, pulled it so that it didn't have any folds in it, so it was smooth, it would be the size of almost like a full newspaper, like a front page of a newspaper, really big surface area. But of course, we don't want to be walking around with a giant head. Uh, so biology has found a way to wrinkle the brain, to fold it in so that it can fit in a small place. So one hint that you are dealing with an organism that has a complex brain is by how many wrinkles you see in the brain. So when you work with mice and rats, their brain is pretty smooth. Their brains aren't very complex. When you go to cats and dogs, a little bit more wrinkles there. In uh, non-human primates like chimpanzees, a lot more wrinkles. And then humans, we got a bunch of them. We got a lot of wrinkles going on there. Um, but brain size is not always uh, the most important metric here. I gave an anecdote in the Q&A as a hint of, about this. So on average, men have bigger brains than women. But on average, women are smarter than men. So it goes to show that size doesn't mean everything when it comes to the nervous system. A bigger brain doesn't necessarily say that you'll be smarter, you'll be able to think better, and so on. And instead, it might have to do with the deeper structures of the brain, the cell populations and how they're connected to each other that might be more important. Um, as a, uh, one more quick anecdote, there is these parts of the brain called white matter. These are the areas of the brain that are the connections. Uh, incidentally, the regions that are like the tree trunk where the electricity flows. There is some speculation that having more white matter means that you might be smarter. It was, there's some... There's some sense that Einstein, for example, had a lot of white matter, way more white matter than the average person, and that allowed him to think creatively and connect ideas together. Also, there's been research to show that more white matter you have, the more likely you are to be a chronic liar, which might be because you're better able to quickly string together a story and narrative out of the blue. So there's lots of different uh, relationships between how the brain looks and what its structure is and your behavior, but it's not always obvious. The brain is very deceptive from how it looks on the outside, from what it actually is on the inside, deep, deep in the structure. That was all really, really interesting. And it was just making me think about the picture you showed in the beginning, you know, just because you're taller than Rick, maybe that doesn't mean everything. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, and so then uh, we have another. Which side are you on right now? I, on. I am just, I am just in the middle here. I am just asking questions. Um, okay, and so we have another question for Rick. Um, we had a couple people wondering about bad memories, um, and so could you talk a little bit about bad memories? And um, a lot of people were also wondering about the relationship between bad memories and things like PTSD. And so, um, if you could elaborate a little bit on that, that would be really helpful for everyone. Thank you. Yeah, so one of the things I didn't go into too much because it's really complicated and I'm still trying to understand it, and so every, all the neuroscientists are trying to understand it is, 
what makes a memory bad versus good? And one thing I didn't really touch on too much is that there's not just much like what Sharif said, there's not just one consciousness area. Memory is actually spread out all throughout the brain. And so there are lots of different areas that are working together to give you one memory. So remember how early on I asked what makes up a memory? There is the what, the when, the where, and there's lots of things involved. And so when it comes to bad memories, there seems to be some brain cells in the BLA that are more likely to be active whenever there's a bad memory. And in the same way, there are some that are more active, more likely to be active when there's a good memory. So there are some brain cells that are involved in, uh, we, we say encoding, which just means like sort of writing down this information uh, for a good or bad memory. And so as that relates to PTSD, uh, whenever you form any memory, you strengthen connections between brain cells or neurons. You may have heard the term before when uh, neurons fire together, they wire together. And so sometimes when something is really, really powerful or strong, a, a sort of uh, event, then it forms a really strong connection between two things. And so those connections allow neurons to reactivate each other. And this can be really good because, for instance, for my mice, whenever they hear that sound, that beep, they think about a milkshake. And that makes them do the thing. It makes them nose poke, right? But, for instance, if it's a bad experience, like in the picture I showed for like a car crash, Sometimes if, you know, someone has a traumatizing experience in a car crash, then getting into a car will make them think about that bad memory. It sort of reactivates this pathway. And so what we're trying to do is understand what happens during this reactivation and can we try to um, hijack the brain a little bit to prevent that memory from being too strong. And so there's some really interesting research that looks at the fact that whenever you remember a memory, whenever you think about it again, you actually make it flexible to where you can change it and you can try to um, make it either less strong. And so that's where a lot of therapy comes in. So it's not just drugs. It's not just, you know, I'm not trying to put lasers in people's brains, but really think about how well, everything we know about the brain and how we behave to try to make things better for people. And that's a really positive um, note to end on. Thank you so much, Sharif, and thank you so much, Rick. Um, like I said earlier, I am not taking any sides. Um, I'm just honestly really happy to be here. I learned so much, um, way more than I knew um, an hour ago. And I'm gonna pass it over to Josie who is going to announce the winner. All right, are we ready for this? Yeah, I see a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of excitement. Okay. Okay, here we go. So. We're gonna move on now to our results from the voting. You guys gave us all your feedback. It's all very exciting. So can we get a drum roll? Let me hear it. I can't really hear you, but let's, let's all get a drum roll. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna go through each question. So the first question we asked you was how understandable was the presentation? And let's see. We have Rick with an average of just over four for that. And Sharif with an average of also just over four. So that was, I'm calling that one a tie. We're calling that one a tie. All right, let's move on to question number two. Question number two, we asked you, how much did this presentation spark your curiosity and imagination? And for this one, we got Rick with a good bit over four this time. Sharif came in a little under four. So this this question goes, this goes to Rick. <laughs> All right, and then the third question we asked you guys was how much more do you feel you know about this topic compared to before? How much did you really learn? Rick, you got him right at a four average. Sharif, again, super close, but right under four. So when we look at our total points, our total average overall, who is our winner? We got to give it to Rick this time. So big congratulations to you. Very exciting. Both absolutely fantastic talks. Very phenomenal. And you can see from the feedback, very close. So don't let it get to your head too much, Rick. Um, <laughs> so now I just want to jump in uh, to kind of what we have coming up for you guys next. So um, next week, we're going back to kind of more similar to uh, the format we had over the summer, for those who were coming then, um, we'll have uh, Kathy be giving a talk. She's a graduate student in neuroscience. Um, 
and she will be talking to us about how our brains develop to let us see. So if you liked what you heard today, this will probably be a fantastic talk for you. Um, and then just moving forward, we're going to be switching it up a little bit each week. So uh, the following week, we'll be doing an Ask Me Anything discussion, so we, where we have uh, graduate students talk a little bit about their pathway to science. The next week, we're not quite sure, but there will be a fantastic talk, I'm sure. <laughs> and then we will be back um, in October with our uh, next episode, our next battle um, for Flip Science Fair.